recorded a <coughs> pure book for us, and I am so grateful for what you've done for us in, in this book. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Daniel has uh, 12 chapters, and if you hold your finger here at Daniel 1, go back to Isaiah 39, and then Jeremiah 52. Let's try the Isaiah 39 first. Okay, Isaiah 39, verse 3, we see that Hezekiah was the king. And remember that he got sick, or and he got sick, and he was supposed to die. And then God gave him a miracle, the sundial going backwards so many degrees, which seems to imply a geocentric uh, centricity, if you think about it. But uh, in Isaiah 39, verse 3, <coughs> this Hezekiah made a grave mistake by, by allowing foreign ambassadors to see his wealth. He was showing it off. And uh, because he made that mistake, God uh, judged him for it. And unfortunately, his descendants are the ones that uh, were the ones that didn't reap the benefit of it, but they were the ones that reaped it. Isaiah 39, 3, Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? Okay, so that's after the foreign ambassador saw all his wealth. And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country unto me, even from Babylon. Then said he, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All that is in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house, and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day, shall be carried to Babylon, nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now watch this guy's attitude. Then, has, then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, O oh, good is the word of the Lord, which thou hast spoken. He said, Moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. What about his grandkids and so forth? Okay, and so uh, the descendants of Hezekiah, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, I forget which, um, are going to be the ones that uh, became these eunuchs. Okay, I hope you know, you know, if you don't know what that is, look at a dictionary. Okay, we have young kids here. Okay, and Daniel was one of those guys. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, how many people were taken uh, by the Babylonians from Judah to Babylon? Okay, how many people? We know of four, five names. Okay, Ezekiel was one, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's the only ones that are named, five. But how many were taken? How many were taken captive? Okay, go to Jeremiah 52. And we discover how many. Jeremiah kept a tally, or at least God kept it for him and then told him. Jeremiah 52, verse 30 is the total. Okay, there were three times the Iraqi army came in. And the first time they took the rich kids. Second time they took the middle class that they wanted. And then the third time uh, they'd left the poor folks there. Didn't care about them. Jeremiah 52, verse 30 says, In the three and twentieth year of Nebuchadnezzar, it's with an R here, Neb Nebuzar Adon, the captain of the guard, carried away captive of the Jews, 750, uh, 45 persons, so that's the third time. All the persons that are, were 4,600. Okay, 4,600 Jewish people were taken to Babylon, but we only know five names. Okay, only, and that's the ones I've mentioned. Now, Daniel and his buddies were no older than 15 years old. 
Okay, that was probably been the, further, the highest age, probably more like 12. So take them, give them 12 to 15, and they were four boys that purposed in their heart that they would not defile themselves. Okay, now how many 12-year-olds or 13-year-olds or 14-year-olds would be able to withstand the pressure? So they were ripped away from their families. Who knows about their parents, if they were killed or not, don't know, but they were ripped away from their parents, taken to a foreign culture, okay, taken over there either on uh, camp by camel, by cart, somehow. So if you can imagine that, try to imagine that, knowing you'll never see your family again, never see your parents again, no Skype, no telephones, Okay, and so, and then you're brought over there and they want to brainwash you for three years. Okay, it's a brainwash is what they're doing. For three years, three solid years, the pressure from the Babylonians. How many 12 and 13 and 14 year olds would be able to withstand that? Four did. Four of them. Okay, we don't know what happened to Ezekiel. Okay, as far as what they did to him and how old he was. Okay, uh, it seems like he was older because his wife died of a stroke when he was over in Babylon. So as a prophet, yeah, he's, he had to be an older man. So they were four uh, or five, count Ezekiel, out of 4,600, we know their names, four of them were younger than 15, and they had enough uh, backbone or had enough... Uh, sincerity in their heart that they are not going to give up their Jewish ways, even though they were attempted to brainwash them. Okay, now, I, you know, you don't know what they, obviously they did some things to them. They, uh, you know, made them eunuchs, okay, so that's bad enough. Now, I, I don't know if they beat them regularly, because that's often what happens when you're trying to brain, brainwash somebody. When you beat them, they always, usually always give in. Okay, but there's no record of that. Okay, but these are four, four boys. Okay, and if you can just imagine, if you've never been away from your home, the loneliness, you know, that uh, you'll never see your parents again. Okay, and, so, and that's eventually what happened to Daniel. He never did go back to Judah. Okay, now, we, you know, Heidi can't come home with her boys. Been that way going on eight years. Uh, and fortunately, we got Skype. Oh, praise the Lord for Skype. <laughs> okay, and so we get to see her every week, you know, and Brent and Jen, we get to, we're going to, you know, once they get their internet set up, we'll see them every week. Okay, but this is a case where in Daniel's day, they had nothing. So you can imagine the emotions that those boys went through. And they stayed true to God. Don't you know they were praying? Yeah, they were praying, God, let's go back, let's go home, let's go home, God, let's go home, and he never did. So Daniel became a captive in Babylon during the reign of a guy named Jehoiakim. Okay, you'll see that in verse 1. And he was a child of royalty. Now, children of royalty are not tough kids. They're usually pretty soft. So he got toughened up pretty quick. Okay, and then in, in the uh, preview of the book, I put the chapter where uh, this was a judgment on Hezekiah. And then we'll start reading down and see what they put these, these uh, boys through. Verse 1, the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, here it's with an R, an N. Jeremiah wrote it with an R, no problem, same name. Sometimes you spell it John, Johnny, Jonathan, John Boy. No, no problem there. Okay, uh, and came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, besieging it is surrounding the city. Nobody comes in, nobody goes out. Obviously, the food supply is going to run out. The food supply ran out after 18 months or prior to 18 months, but they were around the city for 18 months. Uh, food supply ran out. People were eating people. Mothers were eating their children. Okay, uh, Jeremiah wrote about that. 
Okay, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God. Okay, so that's the, the cups and all those things. Did not get the Ark of the Covenant, did not get the table of showbread or the, candle, the uh, candlestick, which he carried into the land of Shinar. Shinar is another name for Babylon. You'll see that in Genesis chapter 11. To the house of his God. Okay, his God, singular. At this time, uh, Muhammad or Allah hadn't been invented yet, the moon god. He was known as a moon god. Later on, they, you know, Muhammad got rid of all these pagan gods around here, and then he made one supreme one, and that was Allah, and he was the moon god. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Okay, and the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs. So this is a, a captain of an army, and he's, he's uh, watching these slaves, if we're going to call them that. And if any of them escape, he gets his head cut off. Okay, that uh, he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of his princes. Children in whom was no blemish. Okay, no blemish as far as their opinion goes. But well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science. That's the first time that word's found in the Bible. Understanding science. Okay, that's used in 1 Timothy 6, but that's a false science. Okay, the evolutionary theory falls under the, the classification of science in the schools, but it's not science. It's a, it's a religion, it's a faith, because science is something that you must be able to observe, either firsthand observe, observation or uh, you can create an experiment and then observe the experiment. Nobody's ever observed or created the observation of the Big Bang. Okay, there's nobody that has ever had a big explosion, huge explosion, and everything landed perfectly in line to the point where, you know, you could set your watch to it. <laughs> Every time, you know, you see explosions, everything usually falls apart and goes all over the place. Okay, one guy said to believe in the evolutionary theory, the likelihood of the evolutionary theory coming true is the likelihood of a tornado hitting a junkyard and a Lamborghini as a result of the tornado coming through. Okay, and so uh, this, these are the children understanding science. Okay, science is observing things. And such as had ability in them to stand in king's palace. Okay, that's, that's just being um, uh, some decorum, some political decorum. It's uh, being uh, appropriate. It's uh, knowing how to act in a certain situation. It's having, you know, your fork, your fork, your fork, your fork, you know, and your spoon, spoon, knife, 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 spoon, spoon, you know, cup, 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 cup. And then you know which one you're supposed to use at which time. Okay, and so uh, that's what these kids were taught. Okay, they had the ability to stand in king's palace and whom they might teach the learning in the tongue of the Chaldeans. Okay, so they're going to brainwash them. They're going to put them in the Babylonian public school system, the governmental indoctrination centers of the Babylonian culture. And they're going to teach them songs about Jews. Jews are pigs. Jews are pigs. They came from monkeys. Came from monkeys. That's what they're taught in Lebanon. Walid Shubat will tell you that. That's what he was taught in school. That Jews are monkeys. Jews are monkeys or whatever. Okay. And they would sing about these things. So they were brainwashed, trying to brainwash them. And not only that, they had a specific diet they wanted them to eat. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. So Michelle Obama, she's gotten a, pres you know, a prescribed diet for the public school kids now. You know, she did it, Hillary did it, you know, making them the good food and everything. Uh, the four food groups, you know, everybody's got to get all the four food groups at the one sitting. And no doubt what this is going to do, uh, if they pump chemicals into the foods, uh, it's going to start dulling their senses. And if you do a little study on the foods at the major corporations, they are putting chemicals in our food 
to make the boys more effeminate, to make the girls more masculine, some of the chemicals that they're putting in the food, natural flavorings and artificial flavorings are nothing but chemicals, either perfume that tastes like strawberries, that's all that they are, okay, or, or chemicals that they put together. It's like McDonald's French fries. They taste the same throughout the whole world, wherever you go. Why? It's the chemicals that they put in them, and it tastes the same everywhere you go. If you put them in a jar, six months later, they're not going to change. They pumped in formaldehyde. You know, that's what they put in dead bodies. Okay, and we had a lady down at Rensselaer that had worked at a carpet store and the formaldehyde that they had in a carpet, she created, she developed such an allergy that she couldn't be around anybody with perfume. Jen, remember that lady? Sat in the back of the church. Anybody that had perfume, they just walked by her. She, she just, I mean, it would almost tear apart. And she only came like three times because the carpet, anything, she ate a salad in a restaurant. You would think that would be okay, but they sprayed some... Uh, preservatives on a salad, and that took her out. She developed such a bad allergy that anything was getting her. Okay, uh, red dye number six is a bad one that really hurts kids. Okay, as far as, you know, the, all these uh, health issues with young kids. So the diet that they're giving them is obviously a standard diet that everybody thinks it's supposed to be good for you and all that stuff. And the diet that um, is being pushed on the Americans is, is really not for our benefit. The uh, major corporations really don't care about our health situation. If it's an international corporation, they do have intentions to bring world population down to 500 million. And one of their ways of doing it is through the food or the imitation food. <laughs> okay. It, you know, where, where do you go to the non-food section in the grocery store? It's when you walk out of the produce part. Everything else is non-food. It's all dead. It'll stay on the shelf for months and months and years and years. It won't affect it. Okay, and that's if you just do a study on, on food and health. Instead of, in the old days, in the old days, most people raised their own food. Okay, but that's not today in our culture. And this is why Americans are so sick. Okay, and so it's something we need to study. Now, uh, these guys, so these guys had this diet, okay, so they had this wine. And uh, Daniel, verse 6, it says, uh, Now among uh, these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's their Jewish name. Everybody knows them by their Babylonian name, except for Daniel. So that's their Jewish name, and it's an interesting study if you study the meanings of their names. It, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a nice picture of salvation. Okay, Daniel, his name means God is my judge. So that tells us that we're going to be judged because we're sinners. The next guy, Hananiah, his name means Jehovah is gracious. So God is going to judge, but yet God is offering... A pardon, and that's his grace. Okay, and then next guy, Mike, uh, Mishael, the E-L on the end of his name as Daniel is the word God, Elohim. And then his name is who is what God is. So God is offering himself. Okay, he's offering himself to be our Savior, who is what God is when we get placed in Christ. And then Azariah, his name's Jehovah is keeper, and once we get saved, God is the one that keeps us. But then if you look at the Babylonian names, it is a worship of the devil. And you see, these people, the mindset of the Babylonians, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so they didn't even want to hear their name that had God's name in it. Sadly, Americans are getting that way. Americans are, get, are so ignorant of the Bible, they don't even recognize that the name is a Bible name. Okay, verse 7, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs <coughs> gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar. Okay, you see at the beginning, Bel, the B-E-L, Bel, that's short for Baal, and that's another name for Allah. That's the moon god. Now, for some reason, they uh, did not keep calling Daniel Belteshazzar. They called him Daniel. But the other three, they got stuck. 
Okay, then to Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. Okay, and Daniel's name, uh, his name, Bel, will protect your life. Okay, Shadrach is the decree of the moon god. That's Allah, the moon god, Shadrach. Uh, Meshach, his name means drawing out. And Abednego, he is the servant of Nebo, or light. Now, that's an interesting thing. A servant of Nebo, or light. This is an interesting thing. Amongst the Masons, uh, there's, a, there's only one statue in Washington, D.C. of a southern general. There's only one, and it's Albert Pike. Albert Pike was a 33rd degree Mason. Was he the founder of the KKK? Do you recall? He was up there, which, okay, I forget. Did he? Okay. Well, Albert Pike, he, he wrote about Adonai. That's a Hebrew name for God. But he writes that Adonai is bad and evil, and the angel of light, the illumined one, is the good God. And the angel of light is Lucifer. Okay, that's Satan. And so in our Bible, Isaiah 14, 12 is the only time the word Lucifer is found. Okay, and the new Bible, the NIV, takes Lucifer out, puts morning star in, and the bright and morning star is Jesus. So they, in the new Bibles, are implying the same as Albert Pike said, Pike County in Arkansas, 33rd degree parallel, okay, where he said, Lucifer's the good God, the bearer of light. And Adonai is the bad god. Okay, and so it's interesting that the Strong's Concordance, you know, the Strong's Concordance, you know, is good for the English portion only. You cannot trust the Greek and Hebrew definitions of the Strong's Concordance because Mr. Strong worked on the Revised Version Committee of 1881 and the American Standard Version of 1901. And if you get a Strong's Concordance for the NIV, you go to look for Lucifer. It's not in there because they take it out, but they put Morning Star in its place. And Mr. James Strong also agreed that Lucifer is the Morning Star. And so you got a lot of people who are carrying King James Bible, but when you hear them say, the Greek says... They're quoting from James Strong, and they're quoting from an NIV unbeknownst to them. Quoting from a pagan Greek guy in the past where they invented these Greek dictionaries. And some of these guys that worked on the RV committee of 1881 was a pedophile, a buddy with Westcott and Hort. You know, how many of these people who are running to the Greek know that? Okay, and so now we know that God is light, 1 John 1, 5 says. Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. He said that. But Satan transforms himself into an angel of light, so that's a false light. And so a lot of these churches, they don't realize, as soon as you hear them, the Greek, the Strong's number, the Strong's number, and they run to these Greek definitions, they don't realize that they're getting tainted definitions by a serpent. Okay, and you know, they, they uh, you know, really hold to this stuff too. It's an amazing thing. James Strong did not even believe in the inspirations of any of the scriptures. In fact, Madame Blavatsky of the 1880s had a better position on the inspiration of the scriptures than James Strong did. She was a, a, a witch of those days. She didn't believe the New Testament was prior, but the Old Testament was, and he didn't buy into any of it. And it's amazing how this has filtered into the church, and people don't even, they trust these definitions, but they don't trust the book. Okay, but that's, that's uh, verse 6. Now, here's the, here's the thing about Daniel. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. There comes a time in all of our lives, we in our heart have to settle something. And we've got to settle it with God. And that there are some things that we are never going to compromise on. 
Okay, and if you don't settle it, if a person doesn't settle that and make this agreement with God, then, then a person can easily waver from that. Now, Daniel, again, like I said, he's no more than 15 years old. And he settled something with God. And he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, Daniel is being very wise, okay? Now, what does a person do when your authority, be it a teacher, parent, okay, whatever, wherever you're at, where you're placed under somebody's authority, what do you do when the authority is, is making you do something that would defile your conscience and hurt your relationship with God? Make a big, bold stand? No, you do what Daniel does. You appeal. You humbly appeal. Okay, and that's what Daniel's doing. He is going to humbly appeal to Melzar. And he says, I don't want to be eating this. I don't want to be drinking this. And so he's kind of getting it figured out in his head. Now, he knows that when, if, when he requests this, that Melzar, if he gives in and he's found out, he's going to get his head cut off. So he's got to consider that person in this context. And so uh, Daniel is going to Melzar, and evidently his behavior was behavior that was such that he wasn't a jerk. Okay, he wasn't fighting the leadership that he was forced to be under. Okay, and so he was evidently complying with some, trying to make Melzar's life easy also, instead of, you know, always far arguing with him and things like that. So it says that God brought him, in verse 9, God brought him, Daniel, into favor and tender love with the prince of eunuchs. So that tells us that he had some likable characteristics in his life. Okay, sometimes kids say, oh, you're the teacher's pet. Okay, now, if a kid is a teacher's pet, Okay, maybe it's because that kid is making her life easier. Being cooperative, you say, well, they're doing it to get a better grade. Okay, well, that's their fault. If they're doing it just because it's the right thing to do, then you ought to jump on a bandwagon. Okay, if they're doing it to get a better grade out of it, well, that's on their head. And the teacher will probably have enough brains to think, see through it. Okay, and so, but yet, if it's the right thing to do, we ought to do the right thing. Okay, instead of just always being a pain and a rump to some people. Okay, always, always pushing the authorities, always pushing. Yeah, you know, I had basketball coaches, some just mean, you know, uh, and some that just laid back. But I tell you, I did everything they did because I had a healthy fear of authority. Okay, and that came from the home. Okay, and that's what a child needs. And when a child does that, it's a natural thing for somebody in a leadership position to gravitate towards somebody who's making his life a little bit easier. That's a natural thing. You don't fault them for that. Okay, so in verse nine, or verse 10, And the prince of the eunuch said unto Andrew, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed me, uh, your meat and your drink. For why should he see your face Worse liking than the children which are your sort, then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. So he's of the mindset, because this is what he's been taught, that this diet that the king has prescribed for you is going to make you healthier. And if, you, if I get you off of this diet, then you're not going to be as healthy, and so you're not going to look good, and then the king's going to find out why you look sick all the time, and then I'm going to be the one in trouble. Well, Daniel's diet is going to make him look better. Okay, if you would keep reading down, uh, give you an illustration that we just experienced ourselves. Okay, where <clears throat> Daniel's diet gave him in ten, day, in 10 days enough physical evidence that convinced Melzar that it was a good idea. Okay, now last time we went to Australia, okay, there's a... <clears throat> There's a fella that we know there, a guy named Ned Caddick. Okay, Ned is a was a professional rugby player, 
6'3", about 250, 260, makes me look like a little runt when he puts his arm around me like that. And uh, Ned's been getting upset with himself because after he got out of the league, you know, he's not exercised as much and he's gained weight. Now, he's not bad, really, to think about it, but he, he's bothered by it. And so he, he, for the last year, he's been exercising. Hadn't changed anything of his diet. Still eats a bunch of potato, potato, potato chips late at night, you know, all that stuff. And he's not losing anything. So we come along and we got talking, Jan got talking about a juice fast, you know, uh, reboot with Joe. And so she came up with the idea, well, let's go on a juice fast. And I said, we're on vacation. <laughs> Okay, and, and then there's Ned. I didn't think Ned would drink any juices with us. I mean, especially beet juice, kale, romaine, lettuce. We went to a produce store and bought $260 worth of produce. So we had these two carts full of all this fruit, vegetables, and everything. And this, he's, he works for a scaffolding company now. And it was, it was 90, 100 degrees when we were there. So the first day he takes, what do we give him, three quarts about of juice? And that's all he was going to drink on the job. One of them tasted okay, two were just horrible. Personally, I did not think he would stick with it. Okay, and then in the evening, then we were going to make the meal. Jan made a meal, it was a healthy meal, and then he's going to come eat with us. Well, the first day he comes back, he stuck with it. He said, man, you wouldn't know what came out of me. <laughs> So he got cleaned out. <laughs> okay, and then, he ate, and then he ate our meal. He said, I've never eaten anything like this in my life. And it tastes so good. He thought it tasted good. Okay, at least that's what he said. Okay, next day he takes his juice to the job and his guys are laughing at him. Okay, and he sticks with it. And he, within, within seven days, his face had gotten thinner. He had lost, well, they do kilos, I don't know, but enough weight that you could actually visibly see a difference in seven days with him. He was ecstatic. And he's still juicing to this day. And now he's got a couple of the heathen on a job that want to juice with him. <laughs> okay? And here it was, a, it, was a, it was 95, it was 100 degrees when we left. But it was like 95, and these guys will get up early and work like f 5 in the morning, and then they'll quit about 2 because of the heat or something like that. And these guys said, man, let's knock off about one. He said, no, let's keep working. <laughs> because he felt he had so much energy, okay, that he physically felt better. Okay, and so, yes, the right kind of diet can result very quickly, depending on a person's makeup. Okay, in Daniel's case, he gave them 10 days. Okay, so in verse 10... Melzar is afraid that he's going to get his head cut off. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servant. So he's giving him a test. Prove thy servants, I beseech thee ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Okay, pulse is a, a vegetable. It's like lentils. Okay, it's a legumes. So it's more of a, it's not a, you know, if he's just sticking with that, it's more of a vegetarian type thing. He's not pushing vegetarian type thing. But still, that's what he said, and water to drink. So he's getting out of the heavy meats, the acidic meats that makes your body acidic. And the wine, the wine was probably, both of them were probably dedicated to the moon god. So he didn't want to do that. And then he said, uh, then let our countenance be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. As thou seest, deal with thy servant. So he gave him a choice in the matter. Very wise thing to do. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And I, and I bet you anything, that was a secret consent. <laughs> that wasn't getting out to anybody. Okay, and at the end of ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Now, Okay, fatter in our culture means beefing out, you know, but fatter in the Bible doesn't mean that. Fatter in the Bible is it looks better. The fattest of the beasts are the best 
cattle or the sheep that you have in your herd or flock, the fattest ones are the best ones. It's nothing to do with, you know, being obese or anything like that in the Bible. It's the best thing that they had. And, it's, and he was saying that their, their, their uh, complexion appeared better is what's going on here. And so that is what convinced Melzar, verse 16. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. And so that's how they you know, live for the next three years. Okay, then verse 17, we've got a paragraph mark, but we'll stop there. Okay, so uh, any questions? <clears throat>